Are you still with me? Woohoo! Well, good. Well, let's talk about the fall of Rome. Finally, huh? We made it to 400. I was hoping to be a little further along, but here we are, 410. Alaric, the leader of a barbarian tribal group known as the Visigoths, led his army against the city of Rome. After a long siege, one of the city gates was somehow open, and Alaric and his troops flooded into the streets of Rome. After three days of plundering, pillaging, murdering, burning, and terrorizing the city, he and his men left Rome in shambles and the Roman residents in shock, grief, and dismay. Roman coins of the day carried the inscription, Invicta Roma Eterna. Anybody want to guess how to translate that? Unconquerable Eternal Rome. Uh, by the way, here's all these are the northern tribes, the Franks, the Vandals, the Ostrogoths, the Visigoths, the Huns. You're going to have the Angles and the Saxons over here. Uh, they begin to flood in from the north, and um, the Visigoths are the ones that are going to be the first ones to get into Rome, and they're going to siege the city and eventually conquer it. Um, this was what the coin said at that time period, unconquerable, eternal Rome. Let me make a suggestion. Don't ever put that on a coin. Um, don't ever say your ship is unsinkable. Uh, don't ever say that uh, your, your nation is unconquerable because it's almost like you're just saying, you're inviting God to show you that that's not true. Uh, there's a painting of Alaric uh, entering into Rome. It's sort of this picture of these barbarians with long beards and sort of looking almost like uh, animals and all these people dressed in white and uh, with olive leaves in their hair. Not probably too accurate, almost like a motorcycle gang at a debutante ball or something up there. <laughs> but um, So that's just a picture that people had as these evil, mean, ugly people coming in and destroying all these people dressed in white with olive branches in their hair. Probably wasn't anything like that, but we do know that they totally wiped out the city and left it marred, crippled, and vulnerable. Um, Jerome, who's one of the leaders of that time period, apparently sits in silence for three days, finally writes to a friend, Rome was besieged, the city to which the whole world fell has fallen. If Rome can perish, what can be safe? And that's sort of the way they looked at it, is everything that felt secure about the Roman Empire feeling it was unconquerable, feeling that even though all the things that are happening, Rome can't fall. It can't fall. It's just too strong. Um, and when it fell, it just suddenly realized everything that you counted on in this world, you realized was a, a false foundation. He spent 13 years, Augustine, writing uh, the city of God to help believers understand. Um, he goes back from the whole scope of history, from the fall of Adam to the end of time. He points people to the heavenly city of God. He basically says no city or nation on earth is to be identified too closely with God's kingdom since his kingdom is above them all. God raises up and brings them down according to his purposes and plan. If I can make a gentle statement, <laughs> we have to be careful because I think we have a tendency to do the same thing with the United States. Love this nation. God has used this nation. But let's never think that God's kingdom is somehow hinged and tied to this nation alone. God's kingdom is above all, and he may raise us up, and he may bring us down. Um, technically, the Roman Empire did not fall in 410. The Eastern Empire is going to continue for another 1,000 years. Uh, it's going to be called the Byzant uh, Byzantine Empire. Uh, Rome itself is going to continue to limp along till 476. There are going to still be people who call themselves the Roman Emperor. They're, their power is limited, and they're, that's not totally eliminated until 476. Six, but psychologically, symbolically, the whole world perished in one city in 410. And suddenly an empire marked by stability, prosperity, and strength turned into a menagerie of independent states, struggling economies, and unstable governments. Uh, why did Rome fall? <laughs> There's lots of views on that. Um, uh, by the way, let's see. So this is the Roman Empire at its height. Uh, this is all it conquered, all of Europe part of the Middle East and Turkey and northern Africa. Uh, after the end of this time period, all I don't know if you can see that, but you have all these sort of, this is the eastern side, it continues. The Vandals have this, uh, the Berbers take over here. The Visigoths, I guess that's the Swaves. The Burgundies, uh, the Burgunds, the Ostrogoths. And basically, 
Now you're going to start seeing Europe start taking shape with all these barbaric groups that come in. Uh, when you talk about the fall of Rome, apparently one historian went back and read all the works talking about the fall of Rome and, and came up with 210 different reasons <laughs> that are given on why Rome fell. The main ones seem to be this, the move of the capital to Constantinople. Obviously, Rome used to be the capital, but now a lot of the power had moved to Constantinople. Obviously, that's going to impact Rome on the long term. And like I said, Constantinople is going to continue on for, for many more years. Uh, Edward Gibbons, apparently in his book, The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, blames Christianity to some extent. Uh, he basically said too much government funds were going to churches and to that kind of infrastructure. And he said the military lost some of its martial vigor due to Christian teaching. In other words, they weren't just those dominating soldiers they used to be because Christianity sort of uh, gave them more mercy. Of course, he ignores the fact that the eastern side of the empire continued for a thousand years. And many people think Christianity is what sustained that empire for a thousand years. And Christianity is actually going to be what keeps stability in the western side. So most people don't necessarily think that was true. Uh, most people look at the Germanization of the military. The military couldn't, most people didn't want to join the military anymore, and so they brought in a lot of mercenaries, and so there were a lot of people uh, from the tribes that eventually destroyed Rome that were actually in the Roman Empire, uh, the Roman army. Uh, most people would just say those northern barbarians actually became pretty advanced. Uh, they invented the horseshoe, and when they invented the horseshoe, many people think that um, just gave them more ability to take horses over further distances, and it gave them a military strength that people hadn't seen back then. And so they just were not barbarians. Uh, they actually were pretty intelligent, and they made an impact. Some of the other ones. Here's, let me just read. Prosperity bred complacency. Uh, the decline of Rome was the natural and inevitable effort, effect of immoderate greatness. Prosperity ripened the principle of decay. Over time, innovation and motivation in the empire was replaced with complacency and lethargy. A cultural malaise affected many people. Military enrollment declined. Entertainment and moral decay grew. Nothing new was invented, established, or produced in the empire, and the cost of maintaining such a large, prosperous empire with no underlying social support eventually caused the empire to collapse upon itself. <laughs> Um, the other issue was as expansion ended. In other words, they used to expand into more and more territories and conquer more territories, and now they were sort of beginning to, to, to collapse on themselves. As expansion ended, taxation began to increase in order to sustain the massive structure of the empire. Increasingly oppressive and arbitrary taxation led to a severe net decrease in trade, technical innovation, and the overall wealth of the empire. Like I said, um, history has a way of repeating itself, and, and you can see some of the same impact that's happening today. I did think this quote was very interesting. It's in the uh, story of Christianity. This is one uh, writer back then who said this, If only to this end have the barbarians been set within Roman borders, that the church of Christ might be filled with Huns, and Suevi with Vandals and Burgundians with diverse and innumerable peoples of believers, then let God's mercy be praised, even if this has taken place through our own destruction. You know what he's saying? He's saying all these barbarians flooded into the gates, and yes, they destroyed our civilization, but all of those eventually were exposed to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he said if it took our destruction for the gospel to impact all of these people we used to call barbarians then God be praised because he succeeded. And so that may be the reason, just like he scattered the church of Jerusalem through persecution. In some sense, he brought those people there to be exposed to the gospel. And um, it's a good reminder that we need to make sure the gospel is at the forefront of our thinking as well. Okay, so let me talk about uh, good old Gregory the Great. Um, oh, Early church characterized by persecution. Then you have the imperial church characterized by prosperity. Now we're going to be to the medieval church, and it's, the, it's characterized by the age of power. The age of power as the imperial church transitions to the medieval church. Let me sort of just visualize what has happened. In the early church, the state is up here, and the church is here, and the state is basically trying to crush the church. 
When Constantine legalizes Christianity, the state and the church now become merged. As Rome falls and there is instability in the Roman part of the western side of the empire, the church is the only place that still has stability. And so what happens now is the church begins to rise and it slowly begins to dominate the state. And so what you've had is state over church, church and state combined, and now you're going to have eventually the church dominating over the state. And it's not going to be a good thing. What you see in Muslim countries, what happens when Islam sort of becomes a dominating force over the government? Not good. And unfortunately, though Christianity has a much stronger base and a much uh, true base, it's still not good when the power is found in the church. Um, let's talk about Gregory. He's called Gregory the Great. Uh, why is he important? If you look in, on page 22, insofar as the modern Catholic system is a legitimate development of medieval Catholicism, Gregory may not unreasonably be termed the father. Almost all the leading principles of the later Catholicism are found, at any rate, in germ in Gregory the Great. If you want to understand what happened in medieval Catholicism, you almost have to go back to Gregory the Great. Many people see him really as the first pope. Um, his teaching is going to develop into some of the concepts of purgatory and penance. He's also going to be very missionary-minded, and he's going to be spreading this medieval Catholicism kind of faith. Uh, there we go. Um, instrumental in spreading the gospel into England. He's the one that's going to start sending missionaries particularly to reach some of the more barbarian uh, tribes over in England. And so in many ways, he's the one that's going to begin to spread this Western um, theological Catholicism all around the world. He's considered by some as the first pope. I know Catholic history would say that's Peter, but if you look from a historical standpoint, men, people look at Gregory the Great as being the first pope. So let me just give you a little time uh, capsule period here. Rome falls... The Western Empire is divided among all these barbarian groups. Um, all of them want more and more territory. Everything is in disarray. Everything is in chaos. And because of that, the people are looking for stability. And again, what's the only place where they can find stability? It's the church. The church has the structure. The church has the stability. Leo the Great, he's another one people think impacted and could be a, the one that really started... Uh, medieval Catholicism. Leo the Great, he epitomizes the role the church had in the New Western Empire. 452, Attila the Hun, how many of you heard of him? He's called the Scourge of God. He is on his uh, route of destruction, and he approaches the city of Rome, and it looks like he's going to wipe out Rome as well. Nobody can stop him. There's no military structure. There's no protection. And so people are looking for somebody to intervene, and wouldn't you know, the head of the church, Leo, intervenes. And he rides his horse out to meet Attila face to face. And no one knows what was said, no one knows what the conversation was, but after they're done talking, Attila gets on his horses with all his men, and he turns around and he leaves. And not too long later, he dies. Do you think that does anything to Leo's uh, reputation in Rome? It just, like, no one else stood up to him. No one, no one even knows what he said. I guess tradition says that apparently Attila, you can't see from this picture, but Attila, as he comes and he meets um, Leo coming over here on his horse, that Attila saw a great army behind him. Um, sort of like that whole Elijah kind of, Elisha kind of thing. And so he saw, wow. And so to, to, his, to some Catholic historians, that's the only explanation why he would turn around, is that he saw uh, Peter and Paul with their swords drawn and a, a massive army behind them, and he turns around and leaves, and that elevates Leo, and that's why he's called Leo the Great. Um, and so you can see the impact it has. Things turn chaotic. Um, people are fighting over Rome. You have some groups, the Ostrogoths, and then the Lombards, and then the Eastern Empire is involved, and, and Rome, again, is being tossed around, and people are trying to uh, invade it, and it's just the city is in shambles. Um, in fact, many people in Rome thought it was the end of the world because there was famine, there was pestilence. Apparently, there were several years where there were floods, <laughs> and everything was flooded, and it was just a miserable time. Gregory was born in that time. He was born to a wealthy Christian family. They say his education was second to none. At the age of 33, he's made the prefect of Rome, in other words, sort of the, the mayor of the city. Um, at age 33, I think nobody wanted a job, but um, 
Oh, by the way, here's some other pictures of Attila. <laughs> that's how we picture Attila the Hun, sort of the big guy with skulls all under his. Uh, that's actually a coin that has his face. He wasn't the handsomest guy. He was a pretty ugly dude. But anyway, um, he leaves and uh, we go on. Let me see what my next slide is. Okay, I'm trying to remember what I have up here. So Gregory the Great is from a, a wealthy family. Um, he's leading Rome. Sort of, he's got sort of a um, he's got leadership abilities. His father dies when he's 35 years old, and he left him a massive amount of wealth. And apparently at this point, Gregory starts to realize, you know what, this wealth is not doing me any good. And he basically gives it all away and begins to start using his father's money to establish monasteries, and he joins one of them. Uh, as a monk, he distinguished himself by his strict di discipline and rigorous asceticism. Like many monks, he's going to have stomach issues that plague him the rest of his life because of the asceticism, because of the, the rigor they put their body through. In 578, he's appointed as one of the seven deacons of Rome, and he's sent to Constantinople. Eastern Empire is still going on. Eastern Empire is still trying to influence Rome, and they're trying to make sure they have that relationship, and so the Pope sends him over as a representative over to Constantinople. And he spends six to eight years there. He never learned the Greek language. Uh, never had an interest in learning it. He, he realized that that empire is in worse shape than what they think. And basically, many people think when he goes over there, the one thing he learns is if we're going to have any trouble in Rome, we ain't getting help from these guys. These guys have their own issues. And so he sort of realizes at the end of that time, we're on our own. He returns to Rome. He becomes the leader of his monastery. 590, the pope of that time dies. And who do you think they want to take over? Gregory. He doesn't want it. In fact, at that time, the approval of the, empire, the pope had to be approved by the emperor in the eastern side of the empire. And so apparently he writes a letter telling him, don't approve this. I don't want it. Please don't approve it. Apparently someone intercepts the letter so it never gets there, and he's approved as the next um, pope, uh, the bishop of Rome on September 3rd, 590. He didn't want it, but he got it. Once, he, once it was confirmed, the this was a man that was just a leader, and he was an administrator. I compare him to Rudy Giuliani there in New York City, and he said, you know what, I didn't want this job, but now it's, I got it. I'm going to clean this thing up. He negotiated a truce with the Lombards who were influencing, who were trying to invade. He cleaned up the city of Rome. He organized food distribution. He eliminated debt and financial mismanagement among the churches, restored discipline and morality to the clergy, instituted changes in the Roman liturgy, sent out missionaries to pagan lands and wrote several books which aimed to synthesize the teachings of the early church fathers. Apparently, everything he did, he wrote detailed instructions. He was a very engineer kind of guy, and he wrote instructions for everything. And one biographer of his life said he was a man who never rested, um, just worked himself to death and uh, was considered a phenomenal leader because of that, that fact. But he was a great leader, but... He also had an influence on theology. Um, this is what the Catholic Encyclopedia says about him. Um, it says, uh, it, will be best, it will be best to clear the ground by admitting, frankly, what Gregory was not. He was not a man of profound learning, not a philosopher, not a conversationalist, hardly even a theologian in the constructive sense of the term. He was a trained Roman lawyer, an administrator, a monk, a missionary, a preacher, above all, a physician of souls and a leader of men. His great claim to remembrance lies in the fact that he is the real father of the medieval papacy. Nor is his, his work less noteworthy in its effect on the temporal position of the papacy. Seizing the opportunity which circumstances offered, he made himself in Italy a power stronger than emperor of, or exarch, and established a political influence which dominated the peninsula for centuries. Um, key thought, he was not a theologian, <laughs> but he was a phenomenal leader. And unfortunately, because he was not a great theologian, he didn't have a really deep understanding of Scripture, but because he was such a respected leader, everything he said eventually is going to have impact. So what are some of the impacts he has? He est helped establish the supremacy of the Bishop of Rome, though he vehemently rejected it personally. <laughs> At that time, the Bishop of Constantinople was wanting to claim the title of universal bishop. The bishop over there thought he should be the leader of the entire church. After all, the Constantinople still had the emperor over there. 
And Gregory just blasted him and said, anyone that takes the name of universal bishop has got the spirit of the Antichrist because there is no person that can claim to be the universal bishop of the church. So even though he rejected that title, guess what he eventually became? <laughs> Pictured as the universal bishop because of his leadership. Uh, penance, he was trying to understand how in the world you find forgiveness you know, when you've sinned. And so he developed, again, remember he's an administrator. He wants detailed instructions on everything. So how in the world do you gain forgiveness? Well, you have contrition, you have confession, then there needs to be some kind of punishment, and then the priest gives you absolution. Remember, Augustine had talked about the possibility of something to purify us because how can sin enter into heaven? There must be some kind of purification that takes place. Well, Gregory's going to be the one that elaborates that again and sort of develops the whole concept of purgatory. Power of the Mass. Apparently somebody during the midst of the Mass, it was an age of superstition, and someone had a vision that Christ was being crucified as the elements were being offered and so that sort of developed into this concept that the Mass was the re-sacrifice of Christ. And he's going to be one that promotes that when you partake of the elements, Christ is being re-sacrificed for you. Clerical celibacy, he's a monk. He thinks celibacy should be the norm. Um, even if, uh, if you're married, you should um, uh, remain celibate in your marriage. And then ultimately, the Gregorian chant is probably traced to him. Um, that's why it's called the Gregorian chant. We don't know for sure, but that or whatever it is, that was sort of the chant that he developed to sort of give some body and sort of reverence to, um, that was a terrible Gregorian chant, but anyway. So um, why do I cover Gregory the Great? Because he is the one who is going to really begin, when you see medieval Catholicism, a lot of it's going to be traced to him. Great leader, probably, if you lived there in that time, you're thankful to have someone like that that was a man of integrity and a man of organization. But unfortunately, not being a theologian, uh, he um, wrote some stuff and developed some stuff that's going to, again, grow and impact generations to come. Yes, Bob. I don't think so. Yes, yep. This is Gregory the Great. I never, I haven't read anything that compares him to Gregory the Illuminator. So, yes, the Gregorian what? Calendar. That's a good question. I don't know. That would make a lot of sense. Like I said, this was a man of serious organization, and so it would make sense that he would try to figure out the calendar as well. Uh, that's a good question. Maybe someone can look that up on line and tell me. Huh? Uh, yes. Question. Yeah, well, based on Augustine, if uh, again, my understanding is if you talk about the church, say, of Rome, you're talking about a collection of different churches that are led by a priest. They where the transition from pastor to priest happened, I'm not real sure, but eventually, instead of being called pastors, they're called priests. And then over all of those churches would be a bishop who's overseeing them. Again, the five main bishops that you have during the, in the early church period that continues on are Constantinople, Antioch, uh, Jerusalem, Alexandria, and Rome. Four of them on the east, which is why the Orthodox Church continues with a patriarchy of those bishops and one of them on the West, which is why the Western Church develops the supremacy of the Bishop of Rome. Uh, there's also this concept of cardinals, and they don't quite know when that developed, when that whole hierarchy developed. So all I know is the simplicity of the church with elders, pastors, leading a church has now grown to priests, and then eventually cardinals, uh, or bishops, and then cardinals, and then the pope, and I don't know, I don't know exactly how that developed. Um, but he had a great impact. Let's look on page 24 and see how far we can get with uh, four... Oh, yes, I'm sorry. Yes. Oh, there you go. So, no, Pope Gregory in 1582. The wonders of technology. Um, 
Yes. Four major developments happen between 600 and 1,000 that are going to, again, shape the world and the church. And the first one is going to be the Islamic advance. Uh, and we are still feeling that, obviously, today. Uh, by A.D. 600, things are starting to stabilize. The Eastern Empire is continuing, and they're enjoying a renaissance on the eastern side. The western side, all these barbarians that came in are being converted to Christianity. And so even though the Western Empire is still in disarray, at least Christianity has won them over. And it looks like at least there's some element of continuity beginning to influence the empire again. And then comes Islam. Um, obviously, I could spend a whole lot of time trying to explain Islam and, 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 and try to give an understanding of it. i not. I probably can't. But let me just give you the basics of historically what happened. He's born in Mecca, the heart of Arabia. It's a haven for idolatry. He's a camel driver, so you can almost compare him to a truck driver today. He's constantly going on these trips, and he's meeting different people. He's seeing all the things going on. He's exposed to both Jews, nominal Christians. We think he's exposed to Ebionites. Ebionites um, had a mistaken view of Jesus. They saw him as just a man who was sort of adopted by God at his baptism, and all he was was a prophet. He was not the son of God. Uh, they also did not have, the Ebionites did not um, accept Paul's epistles, so they did not have any understanding of Pauline uh, theology. And so they had a very distorted view of Christianity, and that's the view that he understood to be the view of Jesus, and he sort of saw that as what Christianity was. Around age 35, he became disgusted with idolatry and immorality in Mecca. He began to believe in a monotheistic God. Apparently, an incident in the Mecca temple, he settles a dispute, makes him convinced he's called to be a religious leader. At age 40, he's able to pursue his calling because he marries a rich, wealthy widow named Kadaja, and that gives him the freedom to just spend the rest 12 years uh, just sort of in this contemplation. At one point, he thinks he's being um, possessed by Satan and demons because he's having these crazy visions, but his wife convinces him, no, he is a great leader and a great prophet from God. Um, his preaching wins 12 converts, but he's not accepted in Mecca. He's kicked out of Mecca, and at age 52, he flees to Medina, and that's considered the first year of the Muslim calendar when he flees to Medina. In Medina, he gains more leaders. He soon builds a mosque for worship, for intense instruction. As a prophet of Allah, he calls for unquestioned obedience, and he got it. After his first wife died, he began to marry numerous other women, and I'm sure many of you have heard that some of them are pretty young as well. Um, he basically becomes a a Arab warlord is basically what he becomes. Um, but he has a great impact. If you read the Koran, and I've read it, and uh, there are some parts that seem to be very conciliatory, and people think he wrote that when he didn't have power, and then there's some parts that are very um, aggressive and jihadist, and he wrote those when he gained power. And once he gains power, it's all over as he begins to abolish idolatry, his goal is to reduce Christianity and Judaism to a position of dependence and spread Islam through force if necessary. If you look at the map, again, this, was, uh, this is the map of the empire. Uh, he's going to begin down here in Mecca and Medina. And after he dies, his followers are going to just be stopped here and reduce the eastern empire to a lot smaller. They're going to go all the way across North Africa. They're going to come up into Spain and eventually they're stopped here. <laughs> if they would not have been stopped at the Battle of Tours, they could have potentially destroyed all of the Western Empire, and we would be talking about a totally different uh, church and world history. Uh, but they stopped there in 732. Um, of course, you can see what their beliefs are and their five pillars are. Um, they're, yeah, they're stopped here at Tours in 732 by a guy named Charles Martel, Charles the Hammer, and you can see how far they advance. And eventually they're pushed a little bit further out of Spain, but they continue to have influence all in these areas. Uh, how important was this that happened back between 600 and 800? Um, well, this is sort of the area they conquered. Um, and if you look at a map today of, oh, so here, 632, when he dies, he controls this area. After his death, by 656, they control this area. And then by 733, I don't know if you can see that, they're basically controlling that whole area I showed you before. And if you look at modern-day Islam, guess where they're still most concentrated? Uh, in the very places that he conquered. So Islam in itself 
what was conquered uh, 1,000, 1,200 years ago is still the heart of Islam today in the Middle East and North Africa and some of those parts of where the prior Persian Empire was, Iraq and Iran. Uh, what's the impact of this? Three things. Uh, the loss of Palestine or the Holy Land into Muslim hands. Uh, that's going to create the Crusades, which we'll talk about next week because the places of Jerusalem and Antioch, all the places that were... Um, places that were Christian sites are now taken over by Islam. The emergence of feudalism, because trade is now impacted, there's not as much trade in the Mediterranean Sea because they're controlling so much of that area of the Mediterranean. Because trade is not happening, what becomes the most valuable commodity? Land. And so land sort of becomes the most valuable commodity, and so the emergence of feudalism. And then the controversy regarding the use of images, that becomes a big issue in the eastern side of the church because Islam had such an impact and was so against images, uh, it creates controversy in the eastern church particularly because they use a lot of icons, and there's this whole controversy on whether that's legitimate or not. I guess it impacts the west as well. But if you go into an eastern orthodox church, you see icons everywhere and pictures everywhere, and... Um, Many people struggle with that because of the influence of Islam, which was so violently against it. Anyway, let me keep moving. Again, I know there's probably questions there, but um, I really can't probably answer some of those. Political dominance. Uh, let me see if I can cover these four, and then we'll, we'll stop for the evening. In the Western Empire, the Francs emerge as the strongest and most unified of the barbaric groups. That sort of is solidified because Charles the Hammer stops the Muslims in 732, and so they are looked at as the one group that has military power and strength. Dependence on the Francs for protection and provision culminates in 800 when Pope Leo III crowns Charlemagne, who's Charles Martel's grandson, as emperor of the West, and thus begins what's often termed the... No, not the Crusades, but that's a good guess. The Holy Roman Empire. Um, if you hear that term, that... When Pope Leo crowns Charlemagne, it's the beginning of what's called the Holy Roman Empire. Um, as Voltaire says, it wasn't holy, it wasn't Roman, and it wasn't much of an empire. <laughs> but uh, anyway, Charlemagne, Charles uh, the Great, I love their names. Charles the Hammer had Pepin the Short, who had Charles the Great, who had Louis the Pious. I just like that. Think about naming my kids, things like that. Uh, Nate the Great and Noah the Pious and Jonah the, I don't know, can't think of them. Anyway, Charlemagne was a man of culture, religion, and war. He established and expanded his rule over the Western Empire through a method that I would call power evangelism, <laughs> which is be baptized or die. Um, it's a very effective evangelistic method. Um, he basically, all these groups that are not part of his empire, as he expands the empire, he basically says, if you are not submitted, um, if you're not baptized to him, that was the key thing. And again, now you have the state and the church joined together. But remember, Leo the Great is the one who crowned him. And the picture is the church is the one that gives power to the state. He was actually a good leader in that sense. He appointed generals. He passed laws. that preaching should be done in the language of the people. Sunday should be as a holy day of rest. Tithes should be collected as taxes. He reformed monasteries, ordered schools to be established in every church for the education of all people, rich or poor. His reforms bring a revival of learning, but then he dies, and Louis the Pious is not nearly as effective as his dad. And after he dies, the empire split among his three sons, and then eventually Otto the Great, becomes more prominent, and so the influence of power shifts from the Francs, which would be the area of France, more to Germany. At the same time, uh, papal decadence begins to happen. The lack of centralized government causes the rise of feudalism, which the most valuable commodity, like we said, is land. Who owned most of the land? The church. And so people began to use simony. They began to sell church positions because it was almost, that's where the power was. So you sold your bishopry. If, if, I, if I resigned and someone uh, wanted to become pastor here, you'd basically take the highest bidder because this church owned land and that land is valuable. So to be pastor here would have power. And so people would pay to, to have that position. And so that's where what goes on in the church. You think that's going to be a good thing for the church? Huh. No, um, 
In fact, let me read what takes place uh, from what's called the Iron Age of the Papacy. The period from around the middle of the 9th century to the middle of the 10th century is often referred to as the Iron Age of the Papacy. This period was marred by papal corruption, including the buying and selling of church offices, nepotism, lavish lifestyles, concubinage, uh, brutality, and even murder, and the domination of the papacy by German kings and by powerful Roman families. During the Iron Age of the papacy, Pope succeeded Pope with bewildering rapidity. In the 94 years from 872 to 965, there were 24 popes. And during the nine years between 896 and 904, there were no less than nine popes. In the Iron Age of the Papacy, according to Matthew Bunsen's The Pope Encyclopedia, the powerful families that dominated Rome not only arranged to have their supporters elected pope, but also had pontiffs deposed and killed to advance their political ambitions, or as vengeance for some action taken by the pope that offended them. As a consequence of those 24 popes who held office from 872 to 965, seven, nearly one-third of them, died violently or under suspicious circumstances. Five popes were assassinated in office or deposed and murdered. John VIII, the first pope to be assassinated, was poisoned by his entourage. When the poison did not act quickly enough, his skull was crushed by blows from a hammer. Both Stephen VII and Leo V were deposed, imprisoned, and strangled. John X was deposed, imprisoned, and suffocated by being smothered with a pillow. Stephen IX was imprisoned, horribly mutilated by having his eyes, nose, lips, tongue, and hands removed and died of his injuries. Two other popes died in circumstances strongly indicative of foul play. Hadrian III was rumored to have been poisoned, and John XII, the sources tell us, either died of a stroke suffered while in bed with a married woman or was beaten to death by the woman's outraged husband. The Iron Age of the papacy produced a number of unfortunate firsts, the first papal assassination, uh, John VIII, was murdered. Uh, Boniface VI became the first and only person to be elected pope after having previously been twice degraded from holy orders for immorality. Sergius III became the first and only pope to order the murder of another pope. Pursuant to his order, Leo V, who had previously been deposed, was strangled in prison. 931, John XI became the first and only illegitimate son of a pope to be elected pope. His father was Sergius III. And in 955, John XII became the first and only teenager to be elected pope. He was 18 at the time. And if that wasn't bad enough, the darkest period or lowest period was called the Cadaver Synod. Ever heard of the Cadaver Synod? <laughs> uh, there was a pope, uh, John, I mean Stephen VII, who when he became pope did not like his predecessor. His predecessor was Formosus. And so he had Formosus' body dug up. And he put him on trial. Um, And so there's actually a painting of a pope dressed in his papal garments, sitting in a chair. He had been dead for seven months, but they dug him up, set him in the chair, actually put a teenager behind him to answer questions for him. And Stephen VII then ran a whole courtroom scene where he accused him of all kinds of crimes. And, of course, a little teenager behind there was, was trying to defend him. And in the end, he was convicted <laughs> of all the crimes. Uh, he was, the papal robes were removed from him. He was um, put in commoner's clothes, and he was put in a common grave. And uh, it was a few years later when all of that was reversed, and so they dug him back up, dressed him back in his papal clothes, and put him back in a proper burial. But people look at that and say, that's how low it got. Um, Whew. You want to know why they call the Dark Ages at times? There you go. At the same time, ecclesiastical severance. Um, here's what's happening. In the East, it's continuing on, and the state still has control of the church. In the West, the church has elevated in power, and now the church has power over the state. Eventually, that's going to start creating some controversies. As you can see, the East and the West begin to have more controversies and issues. There's disagreement over clerical celibacy. The West prohibits married priests. The East permits it. Uh, Communion bread. The West uses only unleavened bread, and the East uses leavened bread. There was a clause added to the Nicene Creed uh, that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and from the Son, and the East did not include that and thought that the West had messed with the Nicene Creed. And, of course, the big issue is in the West, they are beginning to assert the supremacy of the Roman Pope, and the East opposed it. 
So the Eastern and Western churches begin to split, and over time, eventually, one of the popes sends a representative over to Constantinople to try to see if they could reconcile, but the guy he sends is not interested in reconciliation. And so while the Eastern patriarch is conducting a service in Constantinople, the guy walks in to the middle of the church and places an excommunication notice right there on the altar, walks out the back of the church, shakes the dust off of his shoes, and heads back to Rome. Well, the East, not being willing to be outdone, eventually writes another note of excommunication to the Western side. And in 1054, the East and the West split. And so now you're going to have the Roman Catholic Church on the West, and you're going to have what's going to become the Eastern Orthodox Church on the East. And they're going to develop, they have very similar theology because they develop very closely, but eventually they split. Wonderful stuff, huh? That's a terrible place to end. I really did not want to end there. Um, uh, by the way, the Catholic and the Orthodox are trying to get back together. This was something back in 2007 where they, they basically nullified the excommunication. So at least they did that. Of course, the big controversy still is over the supremacy of the Roman bishop. Uh, the East does not want to to accept that in the West. Of course, that would change everything about Catholic theology if he gave up the title of universal bishop of the church. So that's modern news even today. Um, I wish I could cover Bernard of Clairvaux because it would definitely almost like purify our conscience right now. Um, Go for it. it. Well... (laughs) uh, Let me just cover a little bit of it, um, and then we can maybe go back over it. Bernard of Clairvaux, again, it's hard to judge him based on modern times, and so just don't do it. Just appreciate him for who he was in that time period. He had a love for God that many people think recaptured the gospel. Martin Luther's going to say no one loved Jesus like Bernard of Clairvaux. His love for God impacted later reformers. Calvin's going to draw a lot from Bernard. In fact, when, as Calvin begins to understand salvation through grace, he's going to use a lot of Bernard's writings. Did Bernard have some other writings that were not so good? Yeah, but he found a lot that Bernard seemed to really understand salvation through faith by grace alone. Uh, Bernard's love for God still touches us today. Some of the hymns that we have um, are hymns that were written by him. Again, he's a man that joins a monastery. We can't understand that today. But why would people join a monastery? Let me give you... Oh, he's born in Dijon. That's the place where mustard is developed, right up here in uh, France. And that's where he's born. Um, why join a monastery? We don't, it seems sort of odd to us. It's just hard for us to fathom that. But you have to understand they had this concept of self-denial, that you're to forsake all for Christ. The disciples, when they followed Jesus, forsook all. Jesus said, you know, if you're going to follow me, you need to forsake all. And they took that very literally and said, you know what, Um, we're not to have possessions here on earth. I think obviously they took it too far. I think Pauline theology helps us understand that better. But that self-denial was something that they wanted to follow Christ on. Simplicity, if you remember the story of Mary and Martha, they they love that story because Martha's busy going all crazy. And what does Mary do? Just sits at the feet of Jesus. And it said, Jesus said, she has chosen the better part. And so many people thought to spend your life just sitting at the feet of Jesus was really the better part of life. So simplicity. Uh, Service. Uh, The monasteries, many people think, uh, became the cultural centers of that world. They were the place that were the hospitals. They were the hotels. Uh, They did a lot of the agriculture and fed a lot of people. They were the schools. Uh, They were the ones that preserved the writings and learned to copy and be scribes. And they, in many ways, preserved uh, ancient culture because of their emphases. Uh, They're also known for their beer. (laughs) And people liked the way they um, brewed because they were just, uh, again, very much into agriculture. And if... Uh, Yeah, yeah, they're going to be the ones copying and doing all that kind of stuff. Uh, Stability. In a world that's gone haywire and crazy, there's just something appealing about going to a place where there is order and structure to everything you do. And this is probably not the fair comparison, but in our society, as addiction increases and and everything is chaotic, sometimes the only thing that really helps someone break that is when they go to a rehab place where everything is structured. 
And they don't almost have to make any decisions anymore. Everything in life is just told, this is you do this, you do this, you do this. And that structured environment was very appealing in that time period when everything else was chaotic. Uh, he was a man that joined a monastery at age 23. He brought 30 people with him. That shows you already how the influence he is. He joins a monastery that's ruled by the Benedictine rule. Don't have time to get into that too much, but it was a rule that just said well, you, you are to work. It's not all about just uh, singing hymns and memorizing psalms. It's also about physical labor. They had prayer eight times a day. Um, they had obedience to the abbot. Um, that order that he was a part of he was such a strong leader and such a man of integrity that it grew to 350 monasteries by 1150. So by the time he died, that's how much influence his has grown. Some people think one of the popes was so influenced by him and one of his pupils that he truly was the true pope behind that. Let me just read some quotes uh, from him. The steps of humility and pride. Humility is a virtue by which a man has a low opinion of himself because he knows himself well. Just as pure truth is seen only by the pure of heart, so also a brother's miseries are truly experienced only by one who has misery in his own heart. You will never have real mercy for the failings of another until you know and realize that you have the same failings in your soul. When a man has been bragging that he is better than others, he would feel ashamed of himself if he did not live up to his boast and show much better than others he is. He does not so much want to be better as to be seen to be better. He's not so much concerned about leading a better life as appearing to others to do so. On grace and the free will, I was made a sinner by deriving my being from Adam, I am made just by being washed in the blood of Christ. Shall generation by a sinner be sufficient to condemn me? And shall not the blood of Christ be sufficient to justify me? How do we know that Christ has really overcome death precisely and that he who did not deserve it underwent it? How could we be expected to pay a debt which he has already satisfied in our place? He who has assumed the guilt of our sins while bestowing his justice upon us had himself paid our debt of debt and restored us to life. But what kind of justice is this, you may say, that the innocent should die for the guilty? It is not justice, but mercy. You think he understood at least the heart of the gospel? Yeah, I think he did. And, and Calvin's going to draw from that a lot. I want to end with this, and we'll pick up next week, because this is one of my favorite things that he did. In fact, if you look on page 74 and 75, between now and next week, just read that excerpt on loving God. I think it's worth reading, and maybe we can talk about that next week. This is one of my favorite analogy that he gives in there, and I'll end with this, and maybe it'll purify our conscience a little from the uh, whole cadaver scented. He was really good at talking about the progressions that we go through or the development of intimacy with God, and of course he had a lot of illustrations, a lot of analogies with that, but he basically said that all of us begin life with a love of self for self's sake. That's where we begin. I love myself for self's sake, and everything is about me. Um, uh, all of us have that selfish bent, and so life is love of myself for my benefit, and I want life to basically cater to me. He said, when you first trust Christ, you really have what's called a love of God for self's sake. Uh, deep down, as we trust Christ, there's still probably an element of I'm coming to him because I'm getting benefit from this, and so, yes, I'm coming to Christ, but I'm getting eternal life, and I'm getting the benefits of um, this gospel that is being presented to me. And so initially, I come to God, and yes, I love him, but there's still a lot of selfishness there. He says, as you grow in your relationship with God, you begin to love God not for what you get from God, but simply because God is God. To get to the place where I don't love God because life is blessed right now, but I love God regardless of what happens because God is God, and he is ultimately uh, the true treasure of my heart. And to love him is to have everything that the soul deeply wants. It's interesting. You would think he would stop there, right? But he doesn't. He says the final stage, and I, I like this a lot, is love of self for God's sake. And you think, that sounds odd. But he says you get to the place, and I think this is important for a monk, for him to come to this conclusion, where you recognize who you are and your identity. And it's not a selfish thing. It's not a... a egotistical, prideful thing, but you know your identity, and you're finally at peace, but it's not because of selfish reasons, but because you recognize you're created a new creature, a creation of God, and you begin to understand who you are in him. Um, the, the way I understand it, it's almost like I look at it from a marriage standpoint. You know, 
Uh, before I was married, I had love of self for self's sake. It was all about me. Then I meet Liz. And I'd love to say that I fell in love with Liz because of who Liz was, and there was no selfishness involved. But let me be honest. When I fell in love with Liz, is because I saw just who she was, and I just fell in love with her, and there was a lot of selfishness in that because I realized how awesome it would be to have her as my wife. And so there was a love of Liz for self's sake because there was some selfishness there. Hopefully, as a husband in marriage, I grow to the place where I love Liz simply for who she is. And regardless of the condition of our marriage, I just simply love Liz because of who she is, and I want to be a husband that loves her faithfully for her sake and not my own. But eventually, I get to the place where I also love myself, but I do it for Liz's sake, in the sense that uh, I take care of my body. I don't abuse myself. I do things that are wise, understanding that it's important for her that I take care of myself. And so I get to the place where I don't ignore myself, but I'm aware of my uh, condition and my spiritual state and my health because my health impacts her. And it's not for selfish reasons. It's simply because I love her and I want to, to be around as long as possible for her benefit. And I just love that progression because it reminds us uh, that in the end, it's it, coming to the place where I know who I am in Christ and just being loved, just allowing yourself to be loved. It's so hard for us just to allow ourselves to be loved, but to be loved and to allow that love to just cause you to praise God even more. That's the place you want to end up. And I think that's a beautiful picture of what it means to love God. Isn't that a better place to end? <laughs> um, Let's close in a word of prayer, and sorry I kept you a little late. Next week, we'll, we'll finish Bernard de Clairvaux. Read that little excerpt, um, and if you get one of these Christian classics, you could read some of his other material. Uh, he's a man. <laughs> you know what book he preached on the most in the monastery? Song of Solomon. How cruel. <laughs> Can you imagine all these monks out there, and he's preaching on Song of Solomon? Of course, he allegorized it, and it was all about our love for Jesus. But, oh, man, that had to be huff. That must have been tough for those monks. Anyway, um, but I hope you get to read some of that excerpt. Father, we give you praise. Um, we're so far from understanding what it means to love you simply for who you are. And we can be so selfish in that. But teach us what it means to love you for who you are and then to understand who we are. We struggle with that, but may we recognize that you chose us from the foundation of the world. You set your affections on us. We are blessed with every spiritual blessing in Jesus Christ. We are delivered from sin. We're forgiven. We're made heirs. Um, Father, we have so many reasons to give you praise. And so, Father, teach us to, to appreciate the identity we have because of the great love you showed us in Jesus Christ. And continue to teach us as we study the history and legacy of the church and the faith passed down to us. And we pray these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.